So I'm here with Maura Levy and Anit Serper, and we are talking about the soft cell breach. Right. So tell me, how did you discover this breach? So um, it all started with uh, one of our environments that we monitor. Um, basically, what we saw was just a malop being triggered. Um, and then, you know, we started the investigation, uh, starting peeling the on onion layers. Uh, and eventually, we realized that this is something much bigger than just a single malop. So this was the beginning point of this entire story. So it started with one single malop, yep. one alert that was brought to your attention. Yep. How quickly did you see that there was something bigger at play? I think within a few hours. So it all started with our SOC team, our global SOC team, uh, you know, starting the investigation, um, you know, starting to see more and more TTPs and IOCs, some interesting stuff. Um, and then, you know, Amit got pinged about, uh, hey, Amit, can you see uh, this map? Can you have a look? And this was our oh shit moment kind of <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. So, Amit, there was some malware that is known malware that was used in this attack. What makes this so different and such a big issue? Um, what was new here that has never been seen before? So there were a few uh, 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 malware that malwares that we've seen that uh, were not new. Um, however, they were uh, very they were very customized and highly modified uh, versions of things that we knew from before. Uh, be it a, a custom a customized version of uh, of Mimi Cats, downright to a customized version of the China Chopper web shell, or even uh, Poison Ivy Rat, which is um, uh, not not that new uh, um, rat, but uh, it was a customized version with a bunch of features that uh, we've never we haven't really seen before, especially lately since Poison Ivy is yeah. not that new. Yeah. Um, and as as we were as we were sort of looking at the context of, of all of the execution, so uh, you know if we've seen this thing executed on that machine and another thing executed on another on, on a different machine. We, as we started piecing in everything together and look, instead of looking just at, on, on, looking at individual executions yeah. on individual computers, we basically started piecing everything together and look at the broad picture. And that was the moment that we were like, oh wow, there's something huge going here because we have, um, we have computers on different networks there are, that are not supposed to be accessible to the outside world, yet they are transmitting things um, from one network to the other and from there to the outside world. So we're like, oh, wow, that looks like data exfiltration. Then we started looking at the volumes of the data and we saw that it's hundreds of gigabytes. And then we started looking at the malware, at the malwares themselves. So we saw, oh, wow, look, that's a tool. And it, that's it's, its whole purpose is to connect between those two networks that are air gapped. Oh, and look, and there's a rat here also. Oh, and look, and there's a web shell that's executing commands and actually downloading those tools into the internal network. So once we stop looking at things as, as, as individual executions on separate machines, and we said, oh, this thing started here and moved here and then finished here, we were able to understand that this is actually something with, with very big proportions. So this was a huge incident that you said, you know, there's gigabytes of data, yeah. a lot of information being exfiltrated. And we've called this a low and slow type of attack. Yeah. Can you talk more about what that means? Yeah, of course. So as Amit started, started to talk about and started to mention, we basically saw four waves of attack. Um, we're investigating this campaign for the past nine months. And obviously, we're not just investigating this specific uh, environment, but we were able actually to reveal additional companies that were affected by the same threat actor, which we can talk about in a minute. But the low and slow approach, and that's basically what Amit said. So first of all, there are a few waves of attack. And in addition to that, um, you know, the data is fragmented. You have an alert here, you have another tool there. There's a lot of information that kind of floods your brain. 
um, and and that's what the attackers wants to do because it's re very hard to connect those dots and all the puzzle pieces together um, and that's why such an attack is very difficult to detect because some of those alerts can be disregarded as okay it's a very isolated event it's something very specific on specific machine or user and things are not related so if you do not take you know all the details on a huge board and starting you know to connect the dots like in, in a forensic investigation of criminals um, then it's really hard to see all those patterns but once you start to connect all those things it's like you know oh wow it's actually, it's all connected together. So that's the low and slow. <laughs> and that's why they do it, yeah. Yeah, so it's hard to see everything until you put everything up on the board and started yes. connecting exactly. things together. Yeah. And in this case, why was it important to step back and see all those connections? And once you saw them, who did the signs start pointing to? So as, as Moore said, um, there were multiple waves. So if we look, I mean, traditionally, when one looks at something, you know, they tend to, okay, as I said, one execution on a single machine. Hmm, at its own, not that interesting, could be anything. As you zoom out and look, look at the entire thing, you get the proportions of the actual story. When you add on top of that, the whole low and slow thing, as we refer to it, we have seen several waves, like multiple waves, but between each wave, there was between one to three months of yeah, nothing. Exactly. So something would happen, and we'd be like, hmm, interesting. And then there will be silence for three months, for, or, or one or two or three months or two and a half months, whatever, whatever. Each time it was different. And when you don't have anything happening in between those waves, you know, you can think that, oh, maybe uh, they lost interest. Maybe, maybe they lost access. Maybe something else happened. Um, but... It's all about understanding what's happening at each wave. And then when you look at each wave, when you look at the end of wave one and the beginning of wave two, you see that it makes sense. Because if in wave one, they gained access to a particular part of the network, when they'll, go, when they'll come back in wave two, they'll basically continue from where they left off and they will spread to wherever they wanted to get. And in this attack, the attackers knew exactly where they're going. It's not like they were wandering around just stumbling around the network, yeah. tr hoping to, to, to land a domain admin account. They actually knew where they were going. They knew which servers they were after. They knew which queries to run in those servers because they, they dumped databases out. So they knew what they were looking for. So what you saw was a series of almost quarterly attacks where there would be activity. The attacker would be dormant for a few months and then do something again, be dormant. How important was it to be able to look back at data from the last quarter or two quarters ago? And how did that help the investigation? So this was super important and crucial to the investigation because at the time of each attack or each detection we had, uh, you know, retroactively, it's very easy to say, yeah, it's all connected and, you know, you see the big picture. But when you're in the details, you're always looking for leads and you try to cross correlate things that are related to each other. Also, uh, having those gaps of few weeks and months between each one of the waves um, causing you to burn out a little bit. Uh, keep in mind that there are many people that worked on this investigation. We're talking about a uh, few individuals in our company, including our cooperation with the other uh, companies. So the amount of data that was discussed was enormous. Um, and to have the ability that whenever there is a new wave or a new IOC or TTP that has been discovered and to go back and to see, okay, it was already exist then, but we weren't able to reveal it because it was so stealthy. Uh, it's very helpful by cross correlating this entire campaign and to actually today to know to say, oh, those were the waves of the attack when then we couldn't really say those things. So it helped us to create the timeline as well. Anything else you want to add in summary? I think that the big thing here for us is around the type of data that every company has um, and how much value and how sensitive this data could be. Um, also on the accountability of every company that collects people's data. 
uh, we can never know which type of data will be considered as an intelligence asset. In the telco specifically, it is probably well known in the past few years that the data that they have is, is an intelligence asset. But generally speaking, uh, data is power, power and money and so on. Uh, so it's super important to secure that data. That's the big thing here. Thanks so much for talking about Soft Cell. Thank you. And you're welcome. For more information, you can see the blog. Yeah, yeah, the full details are on the blog.